Now I want to go into the, the main case of this morning, which is the uh, North Carolina State Board of Dental Examiners versus Federal Trade Commission. This case is pending before the United States Supreme Court, but let me give you a little background, because if this were genuinely before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court would have the advantage of having read briefs in advance, so they would understand uh, the factual background, and of course they'd understand the legal background in ways that we can't possibly duplicate here this morning, uh, but let me do my best to bring you up to speed a little bit. On one hand, we have the North Carolina State Board of Dental Examiners. And the North Carolina State Board of Dental Examiners is a part of the government of North Carolina, and they license dentists uh, and uh, are concerned about dentistry, and including the unauthorized practice of dentistry is a matter of their concern as well. And in most respects, the North Carolina Dental Board is like licensure boards in other professions and other dentistry boards uh, across the country. But there is one difference, and I, I don't know whether it makes them singular or just unusual, uh, but one thing that is un, uh, special about the North Carolina Dentistry Board is that um, they elect the members of the board. The, most of the members of the Dentistry Board are practicing dentists. That's by statute in North Carolina. And the statute in North Carolina also says that the members, the dentistry members of the dental board are to be elected by the practicing dentists of North Carolina. In most states, maybe every other state, I don't know, the situation would be that uh, the governor, the governor would appoint the members of the dentistry board rather than have them elected. And on the other side, we have the Federal Trade Commission, which is an agency of the federal government, and the Federal Trade Commission has a number of obligations, but among its obligations, is to enforce the federal antitrust laws. Well, in North Carolina, uh, one way that dentists make money is by whitening teeth. And uh, usually the way they do this is they uh, apply uh, a solution to the teeth that's primarily hydrogen peroxide, I believe, uh, and it's done in their office. And it's a, it can be a, a fairly caustic solution. Uh, and so the dentists know how to do it and uh, they're very effective at it, and they make money from whitening teeth. It's a significant part of their business. Um, there are other ways that you can get teeth whitened outside the dentist's office. One way is you can go to the grocery store or to a drugstore and buy uh, teeth whitening strips. And then there's an intermediate way, which is really the most important part for this case, and that is um, there are private parties, non-dentists, not licensed uh, dentists, that provide teeth whitening, and they will also provide a solution. And since they're not uh, uh, licensed, uh, the solution can vary in strength, but typically it would be another hydrogen peroxide solution, and it wouldn't be as caustic, uh, as severe as the one used by the dentist, uh, and maybe it'll take a couple of sessions uh, to, to whiten the teeth, uh, outside the dentist's office, um, and they'll charge less than the dentist. So it's an intermediate step. Uh, what happened was that in North Carolina, uh, the dentists became upset by the non-dental teeth whiteners, uh, and uh, they probably had mixed motives. Uh, probably the economic motive was significant. Uh, maybe they had a health and safety motive as well, and they complained to the dental board. What are you going to do about these non-dentist teeth whiteners? And so what the dental board did uh, was send what were called cease and desist letters, um, basically saying to the non-dentist um, uh, teeth whiteners, uh, cease and desist. Uh, so the non-dentist teeth whiteners were pretty much decided, well, we, we can't mess with the dental board, and we're going to stop. And uh, the, so they complained to the Federal Trade Commission. And uh, the Federal Trade Commission said, well, we think that um, this is a violation of the antitrust laws. And uh, so they sued, or, or they brought, actually it's an administrative uh, complaint against the dental board uh, to say to the dental board, stop, cease and desist with your cease and desist letters. And the dental board defended itself primarily on a 1943 Supreme Court case, Parker versus Brown, 
and the holding of Parker versus Brown is that the federal antitrust laws do not extend to state governments. The litigation center filed an amicus brief uh, in favor of the dental board before the Fourth Circuit, uh, but nevertheless, the Fourth Circuit ruled as it did. The case was then brought before the U.S. Supreme Court on a petition for certiorari. These petitions are very rarely granted. The litigation center filed an amicus brief urging the Supreme Court to accept jurisdiction of this case. Uh, and it was a long shot because the Supreme Court very rarely uh, grants certiorari, but it did in this case. The court is now in session. We will now hear the North Carolina State Board of Dental Examiners against the Federal Trade Commission on certiorari from the United States Court of Appeal for the Fourth Circuit. Counsel? Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Jack Beerig uh, for the North Carolina Board of Dental Examiners. May it please the court. More than 70 years ago, in the case of Parker versus Brown, the Supreme Court ruled that the federal antitrust laws do not apply to the states or to state agencies. Rather, under the so-called state action doctrine, the antitrust laws cover only private individuals and entities. The reason that the antitrust laws don't extend to states and state agencies is that in our American system of government, states are sovereign entities, and the Supreme Court therefore refused to impute to Congress an intent to regulate sovereign states under the antitrust laws in the absence of an explicit statutory directive. Indeed, so great is the respect for states in our system of federalism that even private conduct is immune from the antitrust laws if that conduct is clearly authorized and actively supervised by the states. The question in this case is whether the North Carolina Board of Dental Examiners is or is not a, a legitimate state agency and therefore outside the purview of the antitrust laws. Here we're dealing with a state agency. The state agency uh, is not subject to state supervision. It provides state supervision. It is the entity that is regulating uh, the practice of dentistry in North Carolina. So getting back to the facts, Your Honor, in this case, uh, or this case arose when the board wrote letters to persons who were providing tooth whitening services but who were not licensed dentists. The North Carolina Board concluded that tooth whitening is the practice of dentistry, and it threatened legal action challenging what it regarded as the unlicensed practice of dentistry by these tooth whitening providers. The Federal Trade Commission didn't like this at all. It sued the North Carolina Board, charging that its effort to prevent non-dentists from providing tooth whitening services suppressed competition in the market for such services in North Carolina. Now, the FTC recognized that actions of states and state agencies are generally not covered by the antitrust laws, but it took the position that the North Carolina Board is not the sort of state agency that is immune from the antitrust laws because its members are practicing dentists who are elected by, who are elected by practicing dentists. According to the FTC, the North Carolina Board is a private entity that is subject to the antitrust laws, just like a medical society, a dental society, or any other private actor, and therefore, as Your Honor points out, would be subject to the active supervision and clear articulation prongs of the Mid-Cal case. And let me explain three considerations which demonstrate why uh, the state here should be considered as a state agency that is not uh, subject to the clear articulation or active supervision prongs of the Mid-Cal Doctrine. And those things are pretty simple. The facts, the law, and policy considerations. So let me just address each of these. Let's talk about the facts. There are four facts that leave no doubt that the North Carolina Board is a legitimate state agency. First, the North Carolina legislature explicitly declared that the North Carolina Board is, I'm going to use their words, the agency of the state for the regulation of the practice of dentistry. That's not me talking, that's the North Carolina legislature. Second, under the North Carolina statutes, the 
State Board is vested, quote, with full power and authority to enact rules and regulations governing the practice of dentistry within the state. Third, and here's another important point, the composition and manner of selection of the North Carolina Board of Dentistry was specified by state law. It wasn't decided by the Dental Society. It was specified by state law. And finally, any action of the board was subject to judicial review in the North Carolina courts. Given C these Council, the, uh, with respect to the composition, my, uh, my understanding of the facts is that it's composed of six dentists elected by their peers, one dental hygienist, and one consumer representative appointed by the uh, governor. Is that correct? That is correct. And you're not troubled by the fact that these six competitors uh, oversee uh, issues relating to the practice of dentistry that could have a profound effect on competitors? I'm not troubled by that one bit because that's a decision that was made by the state legislature. What I want to emphasize that it was not made by the North Carolina Dental Association. There are three major policy reasons that uh, it would be a real mistake uh, for this court to hold that the, uh, that the North Carolina Board of Dentistry uh, is in fact fully subject to uh, the antitrust laws. First, exposing state medical boards and state medical boards to the antitrust laws would distort health care policy. And let me give an example. Suppose that a state board of medicine is called upon to determine whether the performance of certain services by a non-physician clinician constitutes the unlicensed practice of medicine. The board may well conclude that the nature of the procedure and the training of the non-physician clinicians are such that permitting those clinicians to perform the services without adequate physician supervision would pose significant risk to patients. However, Knowing that such a decision could expose the board and its members to litigation by the Federal Trade Commission or to a private plaintiff alleging that the decision suppresses competition by non-physician clinicians against doctors, the board may well adopt a rule that permits the exact thing that it regards as being contrary to patient interest. Or the board might simply be so concerned about its exposure to antitrust liability that it takes no position at all. Surely that is very bad public policy. Second, exposing state boards to antitrust liability will discourage qualified and conscientious doctors, dentists from serving on such boards. Such professionals may well conclude that the risk of becoming embroiled in burdensome antitrust litigation with a threat of treble damage actions against them personally is just too great. And that concern, Your Honor, is not just theoretical. It's very, very real. Indeed, following the decision uh, below, chiropractors sued the Virginia Board of Medicine and each of its members on the theory that they had conspired to bar chiropractors from competing against MDs with respect to certain services. Faced with the prospect of that kind of litigation, and the prospect of personal liability, including treble damages and having to pay the plaintiff's attorney's fees, would you, Your Honor, want to serve on a board? I wouldn't. Third and finally, I'll conclude here. For 150 years, the tradition in this country has been state regulation of medicine and dentistry by practicing doctors. Since the mid-19th century, states have made the judgment that the best persons to regulate medicine and dentistry are practitioners who understand the practicalities of the regulated profession and the needs of the patients that those professionals serve. The FTC's approach would undo this 150-year tradition in our country by making it legally unsafe to have practicing doctors serve on state regulatory boards. It seems inconceivable that Congress intended such a radical result. I would respectfully submit, Your Honor, that the decision of the Court of Appeals was wrong and should be reversed. Thank you, Counsel. Counsel for Respondent, Mr. Feinstein. Well, I want to begin by returning to, uh, to first principles. And this, was, this is a principle that was reinforced as recently as a year ago in, in, in the Phoebe Putney case that was already uh, referenced by uh, the Chief Justice. Um, 
and that is that state action immunity is disfavored uh, as a general proposition uh, in, in this country. Uh, the Supreme Court said, given the fundamental national values of free enterprise and economic competition that are embodied in the federal antitrust laws, state action immunity is disfavored, much as are repeals by implication. That doesn't mean that it's impossible for state action to apply in any given situation, but it does mean that it's the law of the land that it should be an uphill battle for the entity seeking immunity from the antitrust laws because they lay out the basic principles of competition that uh, are, uh, have been found to be the best um, uh, allocator of resources in our society in, in, in all sectors, including, uh, including the healthcare sector. Um, having said that, states are nonetheless free to displace the antitrust laws and invoke, and invoke the state action doctrine, but they have to do it correctly. They can't do it by fiat. The bottom line is that both prongs of the state action doctrine, only one of which is at issue here today, but the clear articulation prong and the active supervision prong, which applies to the actions of, of private parties in particular, and, and, and we'll get back to the extent to which it applies here in a minute. Both prongs of that doctrine are necessary to ensure that the action in question, the displacement of competition in question, is really the action of the state. That's, that's the bottom line. States can do it, but these tests have been put in place to make sure that it's truly the goal of the state to, make, to, to replace competition with regulation because the state has reached a conclusion that its citizens are better served by that. And, and, I, and I do disagree uh, 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 pretty, pretty profoundly with uh, my esteemed uh, colleague, Mr. Beerig, uh, with respect to the, the fact that, um, it, that, that the active supervision prong cannot uh, be applied to uh, the actions of a state agency, particularly one which uh, is uh, where, where a uh, decisive coalition is made up of participants in the market that is being regulated, which is what we have here. That's what this case is all about. There are many, many different, different approaches to uh, dental boards and medical boards, and, and, and you know what sort of supervision might be required is not a one-size-fits-all proposition. But this, this, is the, this is the Supreme Court. We have to make rules, and we need to know what the rule is for right. what level of state control right. uh, we're talking about. We have briefs from the American Medical Association and, Association and other friends of the court that say if you don't permit the state action doctrine to protect a board in a situation like this, all hell will break loose in the states with all manner of professionals who for 150 years have been regulated by boards of their peers. I completely agree, Mr. Chief Justice, with your concern that you have to worry about rules of general applicability. Uh, and it may well be appropriate to lay out some, some guidance as to how much supervision is, is, is necessary in particular circumstances. But in this case, uh, uh, the, 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 I think the, the, the notion that this is an assault by the Federal Trade Commission on, on the authority of, 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 the, of the state of North Carolina to regulate dentistry is, 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 is that that argument is misplaced given how narrow uh, the remedy would be. Um, secondly, uh, I want to note that... So is it your position <laughs> that federalism isn't violated if you're dealing with a narrow remedy, if it's just a little bit? No, no. No, that's not my position. I, I believe... That, I believe that federalism is an important underpinning of the state action doctrine, and, <clears throat> and, and, which, and, and it, when I said at the beginning that states are free to displace the antitrust laws if they do it properly, federal law requires that, for, which, which at the end of the day, the supremacy clause does make federal law you know, the final arbiter, but federal law requires that for the state to do it properly, it has to be clear that what's happening is the act of the state pursuant to a policy to displace competition. So you're, you're, you're still suggesting there must be active supervision. I am suggesting that there might be certain actions where the degree of supervision would be, would, would be, uh, would, would be heightened. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Feinstein. Honor. Mr. Berig, you have two minutes for rebuttal. Counsel, counsel for respondent says it's a case-by-case -case issue that you have to know it when you see it to determine whether it really was adopted by the right, state. Right, right. It would be a case-by-case -case, uh, yeah. issue. So put yourself in the position of a state board of medicine or a state board of dentistry, and you're trying to decide whether something that a non-physician clinician or a non-fully -full, licensed dentist is doing. You have to say to yourself, well, if we take this action, 
then we're going to be exposed to three or four or five years of litigation where uh, some court that we don't know who it is is going to decide uh, what the facts are. I want to make one final point, and that is this. Counsel for the Federal Trade Commission argues that if the board had gone to court and sued non-dentist providers of tooth whitening services, that might have been okay. That is a shoot first and ask questions later approach. Thank you, Mr. Varig. Your time has expired. Mr. Thank Varig, you. Mr. Feinstein, well argued on this matter. The case is now closed, and this court will take it under advisement. Hey, qu quick question. The, the statute states that the, uh, the board consists of six dentists licensed in, in North Carolina, one dental hygienist licensed in North Carolina, and one citizen member. So if the board w had less, so that's uh, six, was that six, seven, eight? If the board had more citizen members or member who were, who were not, who, who were not, um, Subject to the subject to to the to, yeah who are not market players, would the board have had more authority in that case? Well, I think I, I think that's. I, I, let me rephrase the question. I think I think if if the board were not controlled by a majority of market participants, um, I think the argument that this was private action through the board as opposed to state action would be weaker. In other words, if there were, there were, if there were three, out of, let's say there were three dentists out of eight, you could still get the input from, from the, the dental professionals about the particular course of action, but they wouldn't control the outcome. I think that would, that would, make, that would strengthen the argument that this is not um, private action. I want to point out that in the Parker versus Brown case, six out of nine of the uh, members of the California agency were themselves market participants. What's important here is that how the board is constituted and how uh, its members are elected is decided by the state legislature. It wasn't decided by the North Carolina Dental Association. It wasn't decided by a group of uh, dentists who sort of were in some kind of private room, you know, making up the rules. This was decided by the people of North Carolina through their legislature. The problem with the FTC's position is that it substitutes what the FTC thinks is right and good policy for what the people through the legislature have decided. And that's just simply wrong. Randy Eastman from Mississippi. Uh, I also serve as president of the Mississippi State Board of Medical Licensure. Dr. Brunson to my right also serves on the board with me. To the litigation center, this is fantastic. This was great and I appreciate y'all coming. A quick question then a comment. The non-dentist or the uh, lay person on the North Carolina Dental Board, did they have a vote? Because we have lay people on our board but they're advisory, they don't vote. My, my recollection of the record is that they did not participate. The okay. lay, they, they, they now, didn't participate in this decision. My comment, I, I, I suspect that one of the reasons we have such a large crowd here is uh, there's probably very few dentists here is that the nursing community is waiting with bated breath as to the decision of the Supreme Court and that will be used against most medical boards when we are about the business of regulating medicine in Mississippi we are all appointed by the governor okay clearly we're a regulatory board however the governor picks one of three that is brought to him by the medical association. So that maybe muddies the water a little bit. Uh, in most states in this country, I think 33 or 34, state statute requires collaborative agreements between physicians and, mental, and uh, APRNs. Uh, we are about the business of trying to regulate the practice of medicine. And we in Mississippi feel that part of the practice of a physician, if they have a mid-level provider, is that mid-level provider. So we have rules and regulations that tell that physician what he or she can or can't do with that mid-level provider. Do you anticipate a, uh, uh, is the decision by the, by the Supreme Court going to be so narrow that it wouldn't affect something like this? Or I know it will be used against us, but I, I don't know how, what kind of effect it would have. Who do you want to answer that? Anybody. Let me take a first cut at that, which, which is that this really gets back to the point I was making about one size fits all. One of it doesn't fit all. One, one, of, the, one of the ways in which I think the record so far before the Supreme Court is somewhat lacking is the scope of this problem, um, which is to say how many states do it, how many different ways. You know, if, if a ruling 
if there is a ruling that active supervision is required in this case, what will in fact be the effects in how many states? I, I, I hope, I don't know this to be the case, I hope that by the time the, the, the you know, there's been some, there, there has been some briefing on that issue, uh, including I think in the, in the AMA brief and, 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 and um, amicus brief, providing uh, some evidence about how some states do it. So, but, so, but we need the denominator, we need to know uh, you know, how widespread is this, is this problem, uh, and, and, and which before you can really fully and understand the implications. My impression, to get to the scope of practice issue that I think was sort of underlying your question, um, I may be mistaken, but my impression is that, that um, ultimately those decisions are, are made by the state legislature more so than by, by medical boards, but I may be mistaken about that. And if yeah. they are made by the legislature, that's, that's the end of the discussion in terms of antitrust enforcement. The FTC may offer it, you know, its position as the legislature is considering it, but, but that's, you know, the, the legislature takes the, it takes the action. That is clearly state action. We, we don't really know how broad the decision of the Supreme Court is going to be. Uh, they may take, they may issue a ruling that says, well, where is here? The members of the board were elected by the Dental Society that then makes it a private actor. We certainly hope that's not the decision. Uh, for the brief of the American Dental Association, the American Medical Association, the Federation of State Medical Boards, and many medical and dental societies, we asked for a very clear ruling that any state board of medicine or of dentistry that is uh, created by the state legislature whose composition and method of selection are determined by the state legislature, whatever that does, that is not subject to the antitrust laws. It's not subject to the uh, active supervision prong of the Mid-Cal case. So we're asking for a sweeping decision, but you know, we could get a sweeping decision the other way or we could get something in between. We don't really know. The, the problem we have, then I'll sit down, and, and I think most states have this, is in statute it says that an advanced practice nurse has to be in a collaborative agreement with a physician to practice in Mississippi. It doesn't define what collaboration is. And we, as, we take the position that it is our role to define collaboration for the physician. And, of course, the nursing community disagrees and says that's beyond our scope. And we'll have to see what the decision says. But one thing we know, the Federal Trade Commission always writes letters to these state boards of medicine saying, you know, you're thinking about limiting the role of nurse practitioners or you're thinking about limiting the role of uh, nurse anesthetists or whatever it might be. You shouldn't be doing that because that really is anti-competitive. Uh, and, of course, the nature of regulation is anti-competitive. If you're going to regulate, you're going to, by definition, limit someone's ability to practice. And it's our view, just as this gentleman said, that that's a decision that has to be made by the state board that was charged to do so by the legislature. Let me just say that I don't agree with Jack's characterization of the FTC's letters. They tend to be to state legislatures. Uh, they tend to be uh, when, when invited, and they, and they tend to disclaim expertise on the, on the quality issue. What they say is if, if, if there is evidence that, that, that quality is not at risk, then it's appropriate for the uh, for the, the, the state legislature uh, to consider the imp the impact on competition when they make their decision. The FTC is not saying disregard quality issues. Thank you, Marilyn Heine from Pennsylvania, uh, also a member of the State Board of Medicine, where our board is appointed by the governor in total and is comprised of public members, allied health professionals, and physicians. So hopefully. We'll be steering clear of some of these areas, but we're very concerned, as Dr. Easterling has pointed out, this is specifically a concern to us in the variety of areas in which we practice. One of the other areas, though, of competition in terms of the FTC's role in ensuring competition that we see as a really high priority, in addition to this particular case and the interest here, we feel that it's very important to focus on things that really do make a difference for the patients and make a difference in terms of allowing them to have access to care, and that is with regard to the health plan mergers and the monopsonistic behavior on those health plans, something that we see as a critical issue in Pennsylvania. We would appreciate an increased focus on that area. Bob Tortolani, uh, Vermont, thank you again for this great presentation. Uh, at no time did I hear any discussion about the, uh, the role of the board, the dental board, in, in protecting the safety of the patient. Uh, I've heard a lot about the competition and what, what role that plays, but 
I imagine one of their major things is the safety. And uh, as we were introducing this, uh, it said that the uh, over-the-counter things had a certain percentage of hydrogen peroxide, then the middle percentage for those who are who are using it, who are non-dentists, and then the dentists using a higher percentage. But at no point was anything said about patient safety, which I think is a very important part of this whole thing. Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, that is at bottom what should be at issue here, is patient safety and the interests of the patient. And the question is really going to be, who's going to decide that? Is it, is it going to be decided by the state board? Uh, who was put there by the legislature, or is it going to be decided by the Federal Trade Commission? There will be different views. This is going to be, I think, I think we could all agree, uh, a chief concern of the Supreme Court in, in that not, not just deciding um, who wins this case, but what message is sent out to all manner of people, what rule you're supposed to follow in the future, and that's why the American Medical Association has really emphasized that in its amicus brief. You know, we, we have a lot of people who need to know what the rule is, just like the question you're asking. Gordon Smith from Maine. Um, and I want to compliment the panel. I, when I got up at 6, I thought I was probably making a horrible mistake. And, <laughs> and um, it was a very good panel and uh, very interesting. The fact you filled up two rooms uh, demonstrates it's an important issue. I have a concern about something you said, Jack, that I, in the way of education of the audience, I think I'm afraid if people in the room take it too literally that um, it would be a problem uh, if the North Carolina Medical Society were to take a position on a scope issue that being a private actor, in that case, it could, it would have antitrust implications. Well, if uh, everybody in this room, most everybody in this room, takes those kinds of positions every day, but is protected because they do it in the, in the form of advocacy before the state legislature, uh, protected under the Noah Pennington Doctrine. So I think it'd be good to give them 60 seconds on why it's okay to go to the legislature and actually you could put in a bill to uh, absolutely eliminate the practice of chiropractic in the state, which, uh, which the doctors of Maine tried to do about 1965, wasn't very successful. Uh, whereas if you take action uh, outside of the context of that exception, that's when you can get into trouble. Well, Gordon, as usual, I'd like to thank you for giving me an opportunity to uh, correct a possible misimpression. Yeah, a medical society can certainly put together proposed legislation that would limit the scope of practice of uh, practitioners who they thought were not practicing in the best interest of patients. That is protected under the First Amendment, the right to petition government. 